I praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. His praise is the water, my enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I praise when I feel it, praise when I don't. I praise because I know. You're still in control My praise is a weapon It's more than a sound My praise is the shout That brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord Oh my soul Praise the Lord, oh my soul. No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Oh, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Watch y'all stand and sing with us. I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Yeah, I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? Oh, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? Oh, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? I've got to praise the Lord, oh my soul. One more time, sing praise. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. This is 
is my testimony from death to life. His grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This, this is my testimony. testimony. Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Whatever you're carrying this morning, you bring it to the Lord. When all I see is the battle, you see the victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see your mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am saved from you yeah. When I find out Find on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. Yeah. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the 
cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. God, the battle belongs to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Amen. We sing this song, Battle Belongs, and it's so awesome because we can just bring everything to his feet. And when we do, we have this ease of recognizing that he is higher than everything we could have laid at his feet. And when he fights those battles for us, he declares them won. The end is decided. He has won the battle. He said it is finished on the cross. Which is why we raise our testimony of his victory and that we've been brought into something greater. Psalm 87 says, On the holy mountain stands the city founded by the Lord. He loves the city of Jerusalem. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are said of you, city of God. I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Philistia too, and Tyre, along with Cush. And I will say, this one was born in Zion. Indeed, of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion, to be registered. He does that for us. As they make music, they will sing, all my fountains are in you. The NLT actually reads, the source of my life springs from Jerusalem, where he won our victory and declared that someday we will go to meet him. And spend eternity in his presence, worshiping him, and just utterly and completely overwhelmed at every moment in the greatest way in worship and love and awe and thanksgiving and joy. And he has given us the gift of singing. We can look forward to that and know it. But he's also given us the ability to sing even now.
How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity There will be a day when I'll bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Every prayer we prayed in desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. There day when I'll bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection, stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations, sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. With angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God, who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord, so let it be today. We shall be sovereign. Thank you for loving us in perfection. In all your might and strength and beauty and wonder. At the highest of heights, you said, then you don't need us. 
but you love us desperately. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for bringing us to you. You are holy. Help us to bow your feet, soften our hearts today to receive you, receive your presence, to acknowledge your goodness and your faithfulness and your victory. that you would teach us and move in us. Change us forever, starting right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, church. Uh, this is really exciting what's going to happen in the next few minutes. Uh, this is Lydia Clausen. Uh, she is the daughter of Drew and Brenda Clausen, and she has grown up right here in our church. And uh, Lydia sent a letter, a support letter to uh, Julie and I about an opportunity that you're going to take part in this summer. Yeah. And you're heading with crew mm -hmm. to New Jersey this summer. And you are praying that God will do a pretty powerful work in your life. Because this is, in your letter you said, this is way out of my <laughs> comfort zone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> tell us, why did you want to take part in this. It's a three-week uh, project this coming summer mm -hmm. in New Jersey. So yeah. talk to us. Um, so I've been super involved with crew since the beginning of my college career, if okay. you would. Um, I have been able to lead a Bible study and Great. mentor a few people. Wow. And one of the biggest missions that we have in crew is to go and spread the gospel to other campuses and around the world. And so... Wow. God kind of placed that on my heart a little bit, and he said, hey, you have to go expand your horizons to from your local com campus to a different one, and maybe go help in ministry in poor neighborhoods over in New Jersey. And so he kind of led, led me to that decision over the new year, and I'm yeah. just super, super excited to yeah. see. As you wrote your support letter, as you're anticipating this summer, there are some specific things that you wrote that said, this is what I'm asking the Lord to do. Share, mm -hmm. the, share those couple, three things yeah. with us. Um, so the first of the three would be working in the hearts of the people we meet um, mm -hmm. and that he, God would open up opportunities for us to share his love and to share his message yeah. um, for other people. The second one was so that um, God would give us wisdom and guidance mm -hmm. on how to interact with people and how to bring them um, the good news and how to yeah. share with them. Um, and the third one was that our team that I'm going with um, would be fully supported, fully funded, so that we can actually go to New Jersey. That would be the yeah. three biggest ones. Yeah. Well, wow. hey, uh, church friends, uh, didn't Jesus say, pray that the Lord would raise up harvest workers? Well, here's one right here. <laughs> and on the bottom of the screen, you're going to see an email that you can get in touch with Lydia if you'd like to be a part of her support team financially, you can sure do that. Pray about that. But I've got to ask her the question that you're probably thinking, how can we pray for you, Lydia? So give us a couple things that we can pray for. Yeah, um, there's two things that um, need the biggest amount of prayer is safety. Mm -hmm. um, as we're working with the people, um, we could be working with poor neighborhoods, mm -hmm. a lot of unrest can be, we can be working with a lot of people who are Anxious. Anxious and hurting. angry and hurting, yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, the second one would be that God would work in our lives and grow us in our personal relationships as well as the people that we are ministering to and that we're working with. Powerful. Pray that the Lord would raise up workers. Here's one. It encourages us, Lydia, and God bless you. We're going to be excited to see how God works Thank in your you. life. Yeah. Thanks, friends. We are excited for Lydia, and I'm pretty sure Bailey is going on summer project this summer too, uh, another one of our college students who's been coming here, so we just want to be praying for them. Uh, summer project is an awesome opportunity to uh, experience ministry, to grow in leadership, and all kinds of things, so uh, we want to be praying for them and send them well. 
And as the Lord stirs us, we just encourage you to continue to have conversations with them and find out other ways we can support them too. A couple other things we want you to be aware of. Uh, two weeks from today, April 28th, is Marathon Sunday in Eau Claire. And the community will be buzzing uh, with lots of activity that day. And we just want you to know that this year, uh, we're trying something a little different. The 8.30 traditional service will continue to happen as normal, but we're going to lean into the marathon and see it as a missional opportunity. Uh, so our life groups may still be, our Sunday morning life groups may still be meeting then. You can check with your leaders. Uh, but instead of having services uh, here on Marathon Sunday in two weeks, we're encouraging people to just invest in the community, invest in their neighbors, uh, maybe go watch the marathon or volunteer there. Uh, maybe spend some time with the neighbor and, that you've been wanting to connect with. Uh, whatever it is, maybe it's connected to the marathon, maybe it's not. Uh, our student ministry families are raising money by helping at the marathon, uh, and they're participating at the relay transition stations. Uh, so there's, those are great places where we can also convene and cheer people on and uh, be an encouragement to people and maybe meet some people along the way. Our, we've got members of our, mission, our worship teams who will be leading worship, actually, outside, down the hill in the third ward um, most of the morning. And so instead of, if you're looking for a place to worship, instead of coming into this empty room, uh, just go down the hall, worship with our team, and uh, we can be outside uh, in the neighborhood praising God, and that can be a good witness too. And so we just want you to think creatively about how you might want to be involved uh, in mission that day across the street, because uh, literally we can walk across the street, cheer people on, and all kinds of things. So we'll have more information about that as in the next couple of weeks, uh, specific encouragements for you to try. There's, there's some information in the bulletin, but the important schedule thing that we want to start putting in your head right now is that in two weeks, there's not a service at 1030 in this space, okay? So, but it's, there's not a service here, but there are other opportunities that we want you to be involved in, okay? We want you to remember both things. All right. Then, uh, you know that we try to support and encourage people, uh, families, as they experience lots of different educational experiences. We've, we've, we're celebrating homeschool. We pray for public schools. We uh, have a number of Christian, opportuni Christian school opportunities, and there are a couple coming up this week. Friday night, Hillcrest Lutheran Academy from Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Will be having their band concert here in the sanctuary at seven o'clock. Uh, Fergus Fall, uh, sorry, Hillcrest is a high school. They actually have grade school through high school, but the high school is a boarding high school. So people from all over the country and even other countries uh, go to school there, and it's uh, part of our denomination. Uh, and so they're coming to visit us on Friday, uh, and. So we invite you to come and take in the band concert. Uh, some of you will be hosting band students, and we appreciate that as well. Then also, uh, just so you know, on Sunday, a more local Christian school opportunity. Uh, Venture Academy will be here just giving information. Uh, it's just another one of the many options for education uh, that's coming up. And so we just want you to know they'll be here. As we turn our attention to prayer this morning, uh, you'll notice flowers up here. Uh, we had a funeral here yesterday for John Michaels. Um, so we want to continue to be praying for Sharon and her family. We mentioned last week uh, that Joy Von Hayden uh, went to be with Jesus, and we want to just continue to ask you to be praying for her family. Uh, you'll see in the bulletin that her service is planned for May 5th. It says it's going to be in Augusta. That's still a little bit of a question mark I found out after we printed it. So uh, it may be here, it may be in Augusta, but it will be, I think, May 5th. Uh, and then also Andy and Becky Johnson, uh, Becky's grandpa, went to be with Jesus as well, and they are uh, 
at the visitation today, funeral tomorrow, so we just want to be praying for them as well. So I will invite you to pray with me. Father God, we come before you today, and we do just want to give you praise and honor and glory because you are great and mighty. Uh, the battle does belong to you, and we want to sing the hymn of heaven like you you are awesome. We need you, and you're enough. You're here. And so we thank you for welcoming us into your space today, and we want to welcome you in as well. As we sing your praises and declare these truths about you, we also ask that you administer to us. And we want to pray for Lydia and Bailey as they prepare for this great summer experience. We pray that you would bless and guide them. We pray that you would uh, raise up the financial support that they need and the prayer support as well uh, for them and for their whole team, and that it would just be a, a rich and awesome time. We also uh, pray that you would give us humble and compassionate hearts to our neighbors and friends who do not yet know you, and we pray that uh, you would help uh, mobilize us and uh, for Marathon Sunday and just uh, pray that you would lead us to shine your light uh, in other people's lives, and uh, we just we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. We want to pray for students, families, and faculty at Mann's Elementary School this week. Uh, we thank you for the people who are following after you and serving at the school, being a part of it. We pray that you would shine your light brightly through them. And Father God, we know that all the people involved in that school are people that you made on purpose that you love and that you know their names, and we pray that you would be at work in their lives, and that you would draw them to you. We also pray uh, for your continued work in Matthias and Ellie Zabodi as they prepare uh, to transition from France to Chad, and uh, we just thank you so much for your work in our lives and your passion to reach people, to rescue us, to turn our direction, and to bring us into your family. And we pray that you would continue that work in us, through us, and around us, across the street and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. It's the perfect word for today. It fits. It's a German word, so if you're of German heritage and I butcher it, ask for forgiveness. It's V-O-R-F-U-E-D-E, -E, a German word, V-O-R-F-U-D-E-E, -E, F-U-E-D-E. -E. It is pronounced for Freida. It's perfect. The word for Freida means the anticipation of joy, the idea of leading up to an event. I had a former colleague tell me, you know, half the fun of vacation is getting prepped for it and looking forward to it. Think about all the things that people look forward to things. Uh, moving into a new home, uh, a vacation, a wedding, a milestone, a new building. Here's why it fits today. It's perfect for today. The most anticipated event in history is the return of Jesus, the culmination of Christ coming back. All of scripture actually point to this. In a very macro way, if you looked at scripture, you would see that in the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed in this way. There are shadows of Jesus. There are types of Jesus. There are forerunners of Jesus. There are people that, uh, when you look back, you go, oh, that, he, that was kind of like pointing us to Jesus. In the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed. In the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. We understand who he is, the Christ, the Son of God. In Acts, Jesus is preached. In the epistles, Jesus is explained or he's taught what it means to follow Jesus. And when you get to the words of Revelation, Jesus is anticipated. In fact, the very first words that come out of the book of Revelation, which we're walking in, is this, the apocalypse or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus is marked by two things that we'll see in the passage we're going to take a look at. First, it's marked by a meal. It's called the wedding feast or the lamb supper, or you could say meal 2.0. 
because his first 1.0 was the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper was given to us, and we practice that, that it might strengthen us and renew us. In the Lamb's Feast, it will be filled with joy. Incredible. What a uh, four Friday experience that will be. But the other thing that we anticipate is a final battle. The, the song that Aaron and the team led us, there will be a final battle in the heavenlies where the enemy of our souls, the great dragon Satan himself, will be killed and will be destroyed, along with the false prophet, along with the beast as well too. Jesus has paid his life as a ransom for us. So this morning, uh, this message is entitled, once I get this working, this message is entitled, The Final Days of Evil, The Final Evil Days. And before we jump into it, let's just do a quick review on where we were last week. Just a quick review, just to kind of bring us all up to speed. Pastor Brian did a great job in walking us through chapter 17 and 18. And what we found out last week was we meet a stunning woman in these two chapters. A stunning woman by the name of Babylon. She represents the empire, the, the powers, the seducing powers. And instead, in this chapter, we don't hear the word stunning. There are raw words that we hear for this woman. John uses the word prostitute, and other English translations use the word harlot or whore. Pastor Brian reminded us to be aware of the allure of Babylon. Not the city, not the country, but what it represents. Anything to get our eyes off Jesus, and he reminded us that it is deceptive and it is devious. And God's people, God's people are to be for him. God calls his people to follow him. Be a part of the team lamb. Follow the lamb, the one who wins. Now, just a quick overview on, on where we're going to go this morning. As we look at chapter 19, we continue the fall of Babylon, but there's a switch. God's people now praise him for bringing judgment. And they use a they use a, a festival, a marriage feast. And the whole idea behind that is finally, finally, we're together. The second thing that we'll look at is that there will be two battles that we'll look at. Two battles. And, and, and the battles are described in two different ways. And right smack dab in them is something called the thousand years of Christ's rule. The thousand years of Christ's rule. Oh, there are tons of interpretations on how you want to play it, how that gets played out. But there is something that we want to make sure that we get right. What we got to know and what we can know. What we got to know and what we can know. And finally this, here's what we can know. In the judgment, in the judgment, there will be final vindication. One pastor said it's one of the most tragic most sombering passages of all time when we come to the judgment seat of God Almighty. There will be finally vindication. So I invite you to find a copy of the scriptures. There's few copies there. Uh, easy to find. Just go to the back of the Bible. It's on page 1074. And we'll read in Jesus' name. If you've got a different translation, we would invite you to. We're going to read all of it. Chapter 19. Did you find a copy there? After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Alleluia! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who seated on the throne and they cried, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like peals of thunder shouting, Alleluia, Alleluia, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. 
For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linens, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Her fine linens stand for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heavens were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter, end quote. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the air, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword, coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him to the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones in which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads and their hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations of the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather for them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, And the death and Hades gave up their dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is God's word. It speaks to us today, and what we hear in the book of Revelation, let him who has ears, let him hear. There's a couple things that we can take away. I want to encourage you to look at your worship bulletin, and you can make some notes here. Here's the first thing that we can say is this. Finally, we're together. 
this idea of a wedding picture is powerfully used, and notice the two different women. There is a bride, and there is the prostitute. The bride, who is the one that we learned in chapter 14, the one who is pure by the grace of God, the one who follows the Lamb into eternal life, the one who has been purchased because of the blood of Christ, and then there are those who are associated with the prostitute Babylon. And because of the mark, the mark of the un-Jesus, anti-Jesus, they will experience what Babylon is experiencing, wrath and judgment. And that will be their future. And notice this marriage feast. This marriage feast, under, if you just un- understand this a part of, uh, of a Jewish wedding, there were three parts to a Jewish wedding. There was first the betrothal, the procession, and then the wedding. The betrothal would act as more than an engagement. The couple would function as they were married already. And the point was, you are to be faithful to that person because you're as good as married in the betrothal. You may say, that sounds strange. Well, you hear about it every year at Christmas. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we hear this. At Christmas time. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And when Joseph heard about this, he was going to divorce her quietly because he was a good and righteous man. Why would he divorce her quietly? Because they were married. For us, as the bride of Christ, we are both the object of Christ's affection and we're the guests. And we are called to be faithful to him, to be faithful in a broken world, faithful in an evil world, to endure hardship. Please, let us make sure that we say to the next generation, to our grandchildren, to young people, to our children, just because it's hard and suffering doesn't mean that God has given up on you. Suffering comes. Endurance is key. It's one of the themes that's in the book of Revelation. Again and again and again, we are to trust our Father in the face of martyrdom. There's another way to look at this too. When you look at the wedding feast, did you notice the change in music? Did you pick that up in 19? If you read 18 and 19, there's a change in music. 18 are songs of woe, W-O-E. Woe, woe, doom, hardship, judgment. 19, alleluia, alleluia. This is crazy. Didn't know about it until I got to studying this passage of Scripture. This is the only time you ever hear the word alleluia in the New Testament. The only time. I mean, it's all over, right? In in the Old Testament, I mean, you read the Psalms, hallelujah, you read uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, and you get to New Testament, and boom, here's the hallelujah, right here. It's the song of God's people. And as one person said, note this, these are songs that are induced by trauma. God's people have seen the expressions of injustice and exploitation and death of God's people. And now they are praising the Lamb. Why? Because he is returning. And instead of standing up like King George did, it's so supposedly King George II in 1743, when he heard Handel's Messiah, he stood up. That's what it's for. Some people think he stood up because he was out of respect. Other people just thought he stood up because he woke up from a nap. Other people thought he just stood up because, frankly, his butt was sore and it was two and a half hours and he needed to do a little stretch. But these people, when they see the lamb, they don't stand up, they fall on their face in worship. They are anticipating Christ coming back. They're anticipating the millennial rule. They are anticipating him finally dealing with Satan once and for all and the white throne of judgment will make all things right And finally, they are anticipating a new heaven and a new earth. Remember this, friend. Remember this, friend. This is so super important that the book of Revelation is primarily a discipleship journal. It is heaven's perspective teaching us, even in the last days, that our personal earthly fate 
must be seen from heaven's perspective. We are to live in light of eternity and live as salt and light in the world. We were built for another place. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, reminds us, it teaches us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. And as a follower of Jesus, ahead of us is life and he waits to greet us. So important. Finally, we're together. Finally, the wedding day has come. And he will welcome us home. Here's the other thing. There will be a final battle. The enemies of our soul will be sent to the pit. There's no, uh, for, for the one who is riding on the horse, there's no two-step authorization needed. Okay? When you, when you see his titles, faithful and true, and then John, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, as he writes these things, you get to verse 13 in uh, chapter 19, 19, verse 13, and it says, and he was the word of God. And I wonder if Paul, or John was smiling when he wrote that, and he thought, I wonder if anyone will catch this in my gospel. John 1, 12, where he said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It, it won't be like, who's that? It's Jesus. He is coming. The final battle will be Christ on, when, when he bursts through, we'll know who he is, but did you notice Something unique about Jesus. In verse 13, it says that he has blood on him. Even before the battle begins, he has blood on him. Different translations, Holman translation says this, he was stained with blood. The CEV translation said he was covered with blood. It clarifies this, this is not a bloodbath. Christ's weapon is the sword from his mouth. The quote that I said, end quote, came from Isaiah 49, 2. It says this, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Our Lord fights with his word alone. He fights because Christ alone, because grace alone and by faith alone and to the glory of God alone he wins. There are those who will reject the proclamation of Jesus, and they are held accountable. Jesus prayed, deliver us from evil, and then Paul unpacks that. Like, how does he deliver us from evil? And in the verses that I listed there, uh, I think they're in your worship bulletin there. You can see a, a couple of them. Romans 8, 38, and 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. And there's others that we fight against principalities and powers. And he, the Lamb King, defeats his enemies. You know, Monday was, uh, there's another way of looking at this. Uh, Monday uh, was the eclipse, right? The total eclipse. Each month, we talk about the divine eclipse. Did you know that? Each month when we practice communion, we say these words, and from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness covered all the land. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have forsaken me? This is all in the dark. And God pours out his wrath on God. All of the stain, all of the sin, all of the payment, God the Father pours out his wrath on God. Now Jesus' disciples, you saw it at Easter, Peter took out a sword, and he wasn't swinging for the ear of Malchus. He was swinging for the head of Malchus. And Jesus said in John chapter 18, verse 11, Put your sword away, Peter. Shall I not drink this cup? And Jesus drank, drank the cup of God's wrath. And because of that, divine vandalism happened in the temple in Jerusalem. Divine vandalism. The Bible says that there was a 60-foot high curtain about eight inches thick separating the temple to the Holy of Holies, and it ripped from top down. And it was significant because it gave us full access to God the Father to come before him and to bring our requests before him. It happened. The divine vandalism, when the, the, the divine eclipse happened. The temple was torn down. And that through the blood of Christ, we have access to the Father. 
Incredible. Now, how will all this happen? How will all this happen? In the middle of these two battles, there is this thousand-year reign. And I want to invite you to um, just look at your worship bulletins and kind of show you where we're at. And there's a key phrase in there. We live in the overlap of the already and the not yet. That's really important. But this, I just want to draw your attention. If, if you don't see, if you don't have a worship bulletin, um, this is really important. This is where we're at right now, okay? The present age where we live. Christ came. It wasn't make-believe. There's strong historical evidence that Jesus actually lived and died. And the future has been invaded by Jesus and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus said, it's better that I go away and send you the comforter. I don't know. If I would have been one of the disciples, I would have gone, really? Like, do you have to leave? And Jesus said, it's better if I do. What we're waiting for is we're waiting the age to come when Jesus comes again, the final evil days. Because he's coming again, evil will be destroyed. And so we live as people of the future between the already and the not yet. He's come, and not yet will he come again. But this part of the coming, that little block, if you just looked, go like this. Take your fingers, take, take your right hand, and just make like a, about three inches. Ready? Go like that, okay? That little block, this bad boy right here that I'm talking about, that shifts all over. At least there's a lot of different interpretations. So on the back side of your bulletin, you can, uh, if you have a bulletin, it's called the Diagrams of the Millennial Views. There's all kinds of interpretations, but I want to show you the big, big picture. These are good people, godly people that have come up with the four different millennial views, how this will happen, how that block will move. Okay, you'll notice, let's call them group A, the dispensational premillennials. There's group B, the historical premillennial. There's group C, the postmillennial. And the group D, the amillennial. Like, okay, what does this mean? Now, notice what they all have in common. Look on the left side. What they have in common is the person of Jesus. You go, well, duh. And notice the church age. Then go all the way over to the right and notice what they all have in common. They all mention the thousand years of Christ. Notice what they all have in common. Satan's little season. Notice what they all have in common. The resurrection and the throne judgment, the white throne judgment. Notice what they have in common. The new heaven and the new earth. Now, this is how this breaks down. Godly people, followers of Jesus, fruits of, the spirit of, uh, fruits of the Spirit, people who trust the Bible, people who God has used, let's group A and B together, okay? These are some of those who, who hold to John MacArthur, David Jeremiah, Chuck Swindoll, Greg Laurie, Hal Lindsey, Jerry Jenkins, John Piper, Tim LaHaye. Those are good people. God's used them. This by far, A and B, is the most popular in the United States, for sure, and probably presently right now. That's who holds the group A and B. If you look at C, which, we called the, which is called the post-millennial, these are, these are good people. Jonathan Edwards and John Owen, they're notable Puritan writers. God used the Puritans in powerful, powerful ways. And there's another guy, Charles Hodge, who is a key Reformed Presbyterian leader. These are good people. God's used them in a powerful, powerful way. They hold in to the C category. And then you got D. Okay? These include Augustine, Church Father, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and more recently maybe B.B. Warfield. What's your point? Here's what you got to know. You got to know this. When we come to the millennial, we have to understand all of these are God's people and they have various views. They love God's word. God has used them to advance his kingdom. But you got to know this. Err on charity. Err on charity and hold this mystery of the millennial 
of the apocalypse of Jesus loosely, you got to know that. When you come to passages of Scripture like this, err on charity and hold loosely this mystery of the apocalypse of Jesus. C.S. Lewis said that the very first words we will say in heaven is, of course! Like, I would go, duh! The lamb wins. This is what you need to know. You need to know this. The lamb wins. Justice will be handed out. And he will bring victory. Here's what we can know for sure. Finally, finally, martyrs will be vindicated. This will be no more. One of the themes, one of the key themes of the book of Revelation is judgment and the plot of justice. One of the other key themes of the book of Revelation is often connected to martyrs. And this is no different. This is no different. Did you catch what, um, what uh, Aaron read when he came to Psalm chapter 87? When he came to chapter, Psalm chapter 87, uh, in, in verse 6, uh, in our call to worship, it says this, the Lord will record or register his people. He'll, he'll register his people. And near the end of chapter 20, you get two different books. You get the book of records, and you get the Lamb's book of life. Psalm 87 talks about the Lamb's book of life. You're registered there. And the book of records, like, Pastor, what is that? The book of records has been called by Augustine, the church father, God's divine memory. There will be no auditing of the books. No one will go, I wonder if he goofed up. No, he didn't. And the way that we can understand who's in the divine records, who's in the register of life, the Lamb's, the, 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 book, the book of life, is helped by Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 is Jesus' description of the divine judgment. And he separates people both in, from the sheep and the goats. And from the sheep and the goats, from who they are, defines what they do. Your name isn't in the book of life because of what you do. Your name is in the book of life because of who knows you and who you know. It's not the other way around. <sighs> if I go to church enough, if I'm nice, you know, if I'm nice to old ladies, if, you know, if I go on mission trips, I do all these checklists. You're not in the Lamb's book of life because of what you do. It's who knows you and do you know him. That's how you get in. Sheep and goats. And, and because we're sheep, in Matthew chapter 25, there's this, it's called the surprise of the saints, where Jesus says, whenever you did it, to the least of these. The, the, the sheep are surprised, like, Lord, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we visit you in prison? And then Jesus says, to the surprise of the sheep, whenever you did it, you did it to the least of these. Whenever you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And so the, the real question is, the real question is when we get to the throne of God, does he know you? Now, good scholarship says, when you get to the verse that says, who's seated there, um, it says the Son of God or God the Father. They're not real definitive on, on who that is. And so I kind of got the giggles as I was thinking about that. I thought, you know, as a child of God, I'm going to win either way. I mean, if Jesus is on the throne, I'm going to look at him and he'll go, hi, Kirk. He knows me. I know him. And if it's God the Father on the throne, Jesus is going to look at Wink and go, I got this. He's with me, Dad. So the question is, do you know the one who's sitting on the throne? Do you know him? I don't know your heart. 
I don't know where you're at with the king. You may have come to this church all your life. You might be watching online. Do you know Christ? Have you turned from sin and say, Father, forgive me. Come into my life. Wash me clean. Daniel chapter 7. It's a powerful passage of scripture. It's this part where Daniel looks in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, and Daniel says, looked and he said, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. And then a river of fire was flowing out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And then I continue to watch because of the boastful words from the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. And other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. And then he said in my vision, Daniel writing here, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the ancient of days, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, he was glory and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never, ever be destroyed. The Lord will come back. The Lord will come back. And because we anticipate him, the final days of evil will be over. That's really good news. That's good news for us to pass on to the next generation. It's, a, it's good news for us when we see the world going crazy to know that we have a hope that Christ will make all things new. He will. He will crush the enemy. He will crush Satan. He will throw him into the pit. And those who know him, those who know him, what great hope we have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. We thank you for the promise that you have given to us. We thank you for these words in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. And as we anticipate you coming back for us, we thank you that you will not leave us alone. You'll make everything right. And so, Father, I pray that if there are people in this room that do not know you or are watching online, that they would wrestle with surrendering their soul and their will to you. You are the gentleman. You are the one who knocks on doors and does not force your way in. You are the way, one who knows us in better than we know ourselves. So as we worship you this day, we thank you for your great and precious promises that you love us, that you will walk with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and we're going to sing this final song. It's appropriately entitled, The Ancient of Days, what uh, Daniel wrote in Daniel chapter 7. Let's sing. We haven't sung this song together sing on Sunday mornings. This is a song that we often sing with our kids on Wednesday nights in Kaleidoscope Kids. So if you know it, your kids may know it. If you're a kid and you're in here, shout it out with us. It's going to be awesome. It's a great song. We think thankful for Dory for leading our kids in musical worship every week.
21 and 22. Great chapters. Eden made all new again. I hope that you'll come and join us. We're going to have uh, communion as well next week. And with communion, we have the anointing of oil. And if that's something that you are in need of, I invite you to be a part of that. Receive this special, special benediction. Now go forth into this world that needs Christ. Go with the memory of this worship hour where you have been refreshed in your soul in the presence of God Almighty and his people. Go with the intent to be faithful to Jesus with the promise that Jesus will carry you in his love and extend that to your family and your friends, to those whom you meet along the way who are in need. And so go with courage, with the resolve not to sin, and go with the exciting reminder that at any moment Jesus may come again. Amen and amen. Enjoy this beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Thanks for coming.